Well, let's dive in. Let's just start from the beginning. How, uh, where did you grow up and, and how did you get here to Point Moment in the first place? Uh, yeah, so I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and um, all throughout growing up, I always loved the water. Spent a lot of time in pools, lakes, rivers up there. Uh, the ocean's a little bit farther removed from Portland, but still get out to the coast every once in a while to go check out the tide pools and stuff. Um, and then ended up going to college my freshman year up in Eugene and uh, ran track, ran track in college in, in Point Loma here too, but uh, uh, basically got kind of tired of being cold and wet all the time in, in Oregon. Like it's very like rainy. Today? Yeah, a little, yeah, <laughs> a little like today, not too bad. Um, but yeah, so then I was up in Eugene and looking around at different opportunities and places that I could um, continue to run track and different places that would uh, be able to study marine science. And, um, you know, Point Loma was, was a, an obvious answer to that. Okay, so you come, you finish out your time here, you graduate, you get this amazing opportunity uh, to go and film around the world. Uh, how did that opportunity come about and, and what did that experience look like? Yeah, so the Rolex Scholarship, um, it kind of came about, mo most of my background, especially while at Point Loma, was doing a lot of like marine conservation projects during the summers. Um, so did a few different things with like scripts, um, working on uh, creating three-dimensional models of coral to kind of look at changes over time in um, their structure and size. And um, another summer I spent up in Anacortes on the San Juan Islands doing a bunch of diving in really cold water um, <laughs> and out planting pinto abalone and kind of trying to bring a, a population back from the brink of extinction. Um, and so through a lot of those things, it kind of shaped um, the career path that I wanted to go down and, and ended up applying for the Rolex scholarship and they liked what they saw, I guess, and uh, picked me for that. And yeah, so spent a year um, traveling around and, and working with a lot of industry leaders and, and really fell more in love with uh, camera work and, and wildlife filmmaking and just the impact that, that can have on, um, you know, the general public and, and really, you know, connecting people with those places. So a little bit about the scholarship. What are they looking for? I mean, is, is it specifically for underwater videography? Is it videography in general? I remember you mentioning to me, they just dumped a bunch of gear. You just got a bunch of gear sent to you and you were like, okay, I've got to learn how to use this now. Talk us through a little bit what that looked like. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was like Christmas for sure, like getting so much stuff. Um, for the year, a lot of, you know, dry suits, wetsuits, and, and camera equipment. Um, but yeah, what they look for, the, the organization's mission statement is to um, foster leaders in the underwater world. And so it's not only um, marine filmmakers, it's, you know, marine scientists, it's technical divers, it's um, kind of a wide variety. If you, if you have a basic interest in anything marine related, you can apply and, and they'll maybe select you, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that was kind of, um, so one of the sponsorships was a camera company. So I got a camera, I got an underwater housing and lights and strobes and everything. And um, they, yeah, tried to figure out how to use it all and tell stories with it. So I'm assuming they didn't just dump you in the water and you had to figure out how to use all these different instruments and, and where to find the different animals. You, you probably had some kind of mentorship, I would imagine. Tell us a little bit about how you got your feet wet, how did you um, really become submerged in the idea of underwater videography? Yeah, um, that's a great question. There have been a lot of mentors along the way um, in the industry, and especially during that year, there were a few different workshops that I was able to attend where um, you know, you kind of learn the basics of you know how to set up the camera and that kind of stuff. Um, but then you delve further into uh, like how to tell a story with your camera and with your with your imagery. Um, and so it's just I mean it's a continual process. Like I'm still learning and always figuring out better ways to tell stories and and get people interested in in marine environments. So you have done. I, I, looking through your bio and looking on IMDb and those kind of things, there's, you know, from Deadliest Catch to National Geographic, uh, what are some of the experiences that have stood out the most to you and why? Yeah, good question. Um, I would say the experiences that have stood out the most to me, I, working on this series here, um, Our Planet, uh, definitely 
it stands out in my mind. Like I did a, a variety of shoots across three of the episodes. Um, and just going into it, the whole uh, mission of the program was to kind of look at the, the status of our planet and see you know, what, what areas are we doing well and what areas are we doing not so well. Because um, you, know, you don't want to pack it full of like, this is terrible and this is terrible and this is terrible and like, there's no hope and, and yeah, you don't want people leaving feeling so defeated. So you know, there's, there's moments of, of things like, you know, we stopped whaling, which is great, and humpback whales have been able to recover all around the world. Um, so working on that project um, was probably, it's probably been one of the highlights of, of my career for sure, just because going into it, the, you know, what we're trying to accomplish was so massive and just believed in so much. Yeah, that's something I think that not everyone absorbs the first time they watch documentaries like this on Netflix, that there's there's more than just the beauty behind the pictures, that conservation is really a key component in the purpose of these films. What does conservation look like to you? How has that really guided your journey and your experience and, and something? Um, well, we'll start with that and then maybe get a takeaway after. But what what piece of conservation has been important to you and how has that been able to be relayed in your work? Yeah, I think the piece that I most like to relay in my work, I guess, is just getting people excited about the ocean. Um, because I think, you know, I feel really blessed in that I've, I've had a lot of training, a lot of opportunities that enable me to go to some of the most incredible places on the planet that most people would never get to see in their lives. Like, um, there's some amazing like underwater caves or different animal interactions that, that I've been able to witness and hope to bring that imagery back to show people that like this world is beautiful and we should care about it. And um, like it always, it, it bothers me a bit sometimes when we make things so like human centric, like I, I get it and I get like, you know, there are economics involved with needing, you know, with protecting things. But I feel like sometimes I just want people to care about something because it's beautiful. And like, you know, why should we let this abalone population go extinct? It's just, it's an animal on this planet and I feel like God has put us on this planet and he's given this to us and we should take care of it. And I feel like that, you know, should be enough sometimes, but. Um. So what is a takeaway for, for us sitting here? If there's one thing that we could go away and do differently tomorrow, what would be a suggestion as far as the conservation end of things or uh, ocean awareness? Yeah. Um, there are uh, quite a few things, I, I'd say. <laughs> no, no. Um, we'll be here the rest of the night talking yeah. about conservation. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I think one of the things that's, like, on the forefront quite often is, like, single-use plastics. Mm. And I think, you know, removing those from your life as much as possible is really important and I think it, it just gets a lot of media attention because it's like in your face and it's something that's very obvious that we can change. Um, but I would actually say like one of the biggest conservation issues I think facing the ocean is, is overfishing. Um, I think we're just taking too much out of the ocean and like it, it's eventually gonna run out. Like it can seem so vast and endless, but um, yeah, there, there is an end to it and so I think one of the things that people can do is the Monterey Bay Aquarium actually has uh, this app called Seafood Watch. Uh, or if you're old school, you can actually like write to them and get this little pocket book thing that you can stick in your wallet. Uh, so either way. But yeah, it will, it will break it down by region, like when you're out at a restaurant, like knowing what's a sustainable fish to eat or um, those kinds of things. So I think that's kind of things that you know people can change in their day-to-day -day lives that can have a major effect. How does San Diego fall in that? I mean, I would imagine there's tons of seafood consumed here daily. Uh, is there a, a like range that we fall into that's uh, sustainable or unsustainable, or, or is that a much larger picture? That is a great question that I do not know the answer to. I feel like we'll I have to get the pocket Neil up there. At okay. Works for the <laughs> WWF, but um, <laughs> yeah, hiding his face. Um, no, I just think that, like, I think, too, a lot of times when I say things like that, people think that I'm against fishing. And, you know, I'm not against fishing at all. Like, you know, it's, it's the way that most of the world gets their protein. And it's super important. I just think we need to be smarter about it. We need to do it more sustainably and, and put areas of the ocean aside that um, we don't touch. And, you know, let the ecosystem and the fishery recover. And then 
um, you know, it's what's called marine protected areas. And it's shown to be really, really successful um, because not only can the fishery recover in that spot, but then it starts spilling over outside of that. And so fishermen benefit from it as well. Um, so yeah, I think we just need to protect a little bit more of our ocean. So what does a day in the life of Jeff Hester look like? Um, from our email cor correspondences and your crazy schedule, it seems like you are all over the world all the time. Um, but what, is it, what does a day look like? And then what does it take to make something like what we're going to see tonight? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I apologize for being so <laughs> terrible at communication. No, it's exciting. And to, uh, <laughs> I wish I was there, you know all the places I that am, you were. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, typical day, like on a shoot, it kind of depends on what you're shooting. Um, if you're out trying to get like open ocean stuff, it's a lot of driving around on the water and looking out at nothing. <laughs> like you just spend multiple hours a day um, just searching a lot of times. Like With how many people? What, is, what does your boat look like that you're on? Yeah, so it can vary, but I mean, it's typically around four people. Um, yeah, yeah, about four people, but... Yeah, I mean, it all comes down, a lot of times, like, open ocean work comes down to, you know, two amazing hours when everything comes together. You get the weather, you get the animals, you get the behavior, um, and you just have to be prepared for it, because that's probably the only chance you're going to get. Um, yeah, so that's kind of open ocean stuff. And then benthic work, like working on seafloor and, and kelp forests, it's a lot of, again, sitting underwater and waiting for animals to do stuff. Um, so sometimes you'll sit underwater for four, five, six hours at a time and just wait for a fish to eat something or like you're just picking apart behavior and kind of trying to figure out the best way to tell the story and make it the most interesting and engaging for the audience and um, you know finding your rises and falls and things like that. So do you consider yourself more of a filmmaker or a biologist? Ooh. I guess now probably more filmmaker, yeah. But it's, it is really useful to have the biology background because I, I can kind of understand a little bit more of, of uh, like the animal's behavior and, and stuff like that. But yeah, probably more filmmaker. Okay. Uh, I'm sure this is going to be of interest to the audience, so I will ask. And I'm personally interested, but uh, <laughs> what, is, what has been your favorite animal encounter? What's your favorite animal? Basically, I'm asking what a three-year-old would want to know. But, oh. but you've now gotten to be with them. So we all want to know, I think, what has been your greatest experience. Yeah, I would say, well, slightly different. So okay. first, I'll answer the quick question of my favorite, favorite animal, animal. Okay. <laughs> is a nudibranch, which is like a little colorful sea slug called Glaucus atlanticus is the, the Latin name for it. It's, um, it's like a sea dragon. But they're these amazing little nude ranks that eat Portuguese man o' war um, tentacles, which are like pretty stingy. If yeah, it's like a jellyfish, and then they can actually take the uh, stinging cells and incorporate them into its own body to use as a defense mechanism. So those are amazing. But I would say my favorite animal encounter has to be humpback whales. Um, humpback whales. I filmed them a few times, and there's always this like. It's probably me just anthropomorphizing them, but I feel like you have this connection, and they'll like look you in the eye, and they'll sit and interact with you. Um, I don't know if is is anything. No, projection's not working. Okay, maybe later. There's like later. yeah, we did this um, uh, shoot out in Tonga um, last fall. Um, it was a VR experience, and it was with humpback whales, and had this humpback whale calf that just like wouldn't leave me alone. Like for hours on end, it just hung out just like a couple feet from me and like just throwing its pectoral fin over my head and like throwing its tail toward me, which you have to be careful because <laughs> it's like those are big babies that could do a lot of damage. But yeah, that was pretty I mean, experience. for really though, how, how large was that animal? Oh yeah, the animal was, I mean, it's probably like pushing 20 feet sure. and pretty... <laughs> Pretty beefy, a lot bigger than me. Yeah, you yeah. feel very small in that moment, yes, I would imagine. Definitely. Wow. Very small. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, well, I think at this point, um, well, actually, there I do have one other question I would like to know is, um, you know, coming from a faith-based community, being surrounded by the faculty and staff that um, 
show us on a daily basis, I think, how you integrate your faith and your work life. What does that look like for you uh, as you've graduated and left Point Loma and now are out all over the world? Um, how does your faith become a part of your daily work? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, uh, for one, just, you know, kind of what I touched on a little bit earlier, but, um, you know, I really believe that this planet, you know, God gave us to protect and to care for. And so I think just I hope that through my work and my imagery that people, like, feel that desire and are, um, I guess, get more invested in, in ways that they can live, like, conscientiously and um, sustainably. Um, yeah, so I think that's kind of one aspect. And then um, another that I feel like my faith comes through a bit, I've noticed on, um, like, you know, on, on a lot of shoots, you get thrown into these in intense situations with people that you don't know a lot of times. And it can get really tense when, you know, the animals aren't cooperating, the weather's not co cooperating or whatever. Um, and it's been really interesting for me. I found over the years with different shoots, people, like, just a few days in are always like, are you religious? Because mm. you, like, act differently. Mm. Um, and so I think, I mean, it's nothing that I feel like I purposefully do. Mm. Um, but just trying to be, you know, trying to have, like, God's love shine through me um, is kind of a way, I, yeah, I try to do in my day-to-day -day life. That's awesome. I think we're going to take some questions from the audience, if you're okay with that. All right. I, okay. Yeah, let's do it. Um, if you have a question for Jeff, uh, Chelsea's going to come and, and bring you the microphone as quickly as you can in the, the Greek. Should we time her, maybe? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so if you just have everyone to throw your hand up, we'll try to get as many questions as we can. Right. I was wondering uh, where you live, and also do you have a website or some way we could contact you and kind of keep track of what's going on in the future? Yeah, definitely. So living here in San Diego, um, I am terrible at updating my website, so my Instagram <laughs> is the best way to go. Um, but yeah, I can. That's just Jeff B. Hester. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if there's a way to share that or yeah. something. <laughs> Any other questions? I see one in the front, no? I'm coming. Run, run, run. <laughs> Poor Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like... Um, I don't know. I was going to ask a question, but I actually just raised my hand. I thought there was a bidding thing, where like, <laughs> like an auction thing. I was going to like say how much for that, but uh, no, seriously. Uh, for me, for a date? Yeah, or yeah, a for a date, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like, dude, oh, let's go. We got some single people over here, so <laughs> no, um, no, we're really excited to see your film, and we're so happy to be here, and glad you're here too. So, oh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. Awesome. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> I did not plan for this. <laughs> I should wear my uh, running shoes. How would a high school student get started in this if they wanted to follow this kind of career path? Yeah, yeah, definitely a great question. Um, I find that most people in the industry kind of get to this career path in different ways. Um, having an understanding of the animals is, is usually a pretty good one. So getting a you know, biology degree or... Um, you know, studying marine science. And then I feel like, to, uh, especially underwater, um, one of the first things you need to be is like really comfortable in the water. Uh, so just spend a lot of time doing, you know, free diving, scuba diving. Um, a lot of work now, too, for wildlife is uh, actually on what's called a rebreather. Um, that's like a technical, um, it's like this backpack that you wear where, uh, you know, the air, um, it's, it's like one continuous loop. So, you're not exhaling, it allows you to spend a lot of time underwater, get really close to animals. Um, so yeah, those kind of things. Just being really comfortable in the water first and foremost, and then you know, taking a camera down there. <laughs> um, have you ever photographed in Antarctica before? I have, yeah. 
Yeah, I went down there in the beginning of 2014. Yeah, to, um, I was mostly filming penguins. Yeah, it was a pretty amazing environment. Yeah, glaciers and icebergs, it's an yeah, incredible place. Do you want to go someday? Yeah? <laughs> nice. You like penguins? Yeah, penguins are awesome. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, thanks for being here. This is a fascinating subject. I was wondering, have you ever been out to where that big swirl of plastic is in the Pacific? And have they identified where, it, where it's coming from? Yeah, no, I haven't personally um, been out there to the, I think you're referring to the uh, Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and most of it seems uh, to be coming just from land. Like, you know, through the ocean currents, they work their way out into specific areas. Um, one of the interesting new studies that's coming out is that it's not only, you know, these plastics aren't just on the surface, they're basically in every layer of the water column. And so there's a, a researcher at Scripps that's studying plastics, and she pulls up a lot of like deep sea fish, and she actually found like a Lego in one of their stomachs recently. And this is a fish that never comes to the surface. So it's kind of a it's a grim um, future, somewhat. <laughs> but yeah, it seems to have kind of permeated every level of the water column. Uh, what's been your most dangerous experience in the water? Ooh, most dangerous experience in the water. Um, uh, not in the, I guess not in the water, but the most scariest experience I've had was um, filming for Deadliest Catch. Uh, it was just like, I don't know, it was just cold and wet, and especially up in the Bering Sea, the seas are massive. Um, so like a lot of nights I would just wedge myself in between these two pillars so that I could get some sleep. It was like under the, the galley, um, one of the dining room tables, and then using my like survival suit as a pillow, which is what you pull on if the ship's about to go down. Um, and we ended up losing like one of our main engines one time, and yeah, it was just it was rough. It was a lot of sleepless nights, I think, for my wife and my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tor. Have you ever seen a squid? Yes, I have. And I think uh, once it gets a little darker, you'll be able to see some, some squid on the projector that I shot. Uh, but some just right out here off of uh, San Diego. So if you're local and you eventually get your scuba dive certification, you can go check them out yourself, too. Any other questions? OK, way over there. I'm coming. Oh. Thanks for meeting me halfway. Don't give that guy a mic. <laughs> uh -oh. Hello, Jeffrey. You look great. <laughs> oh, you're too kind. Um, when you're uh, shooting um, film for, I, I'm assuming that like, people contract you for um, different shots. I don't. Um, and are they pretty lenient with deadlines? Do they understand that nature doesn't work? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it doesn't help us out really when you're trying to get good shots. Yeah, most of the time they do if they're if they're like seasoned in the industry. Um, like there are a few producers that understand, especially ocean. Like open ocean stuff is just tough. Like it's so much different than than like terrestrial wildlife. Um, you know, you can you can go for three four weeks without seeing anything that you need to film. So the so the people who've been doing it for a while are pretty understanding of that and know that going in you might just not get anything. Um, you know, some of the younger producers get pretty antsy on like day two and it's like, oh, we can't go out again, what? Um, so yeah, you've kind of always got to uh, temper expectations with some, with some of those, but for the most part, people understand, yeah. Can I hear my question? Yes. So something you told me while we were discussing that same question was how much time it takes to just shoot one segment. Can you kind of give them an idea about the 45 minutes we're, we're going to watch and, and how much time it actually takes to capture. Yeah, definitely. Um, so especially this type of stuff, like our planet, it's, it's what's called like blue chip natural history wildlife. So it's usually like higher budget, you know, it's shot over three or four years. Um, and so they really have, we really have the time to devote to getting the sequences that we want. So you're able to, you know, you know, take higher risks than you might normally. 
Um, but for, yeah, about three to four minute sequences, it usually takes, I'd say on average, four weeks to shoot. Um, yeah, you might go in and get it in three weeks, but if you don't get it that time around, you'll go back out for another three weeks. Um, so yeah, so 45 minutes, um, yeah, is probably like, I don't know, can't do the math right now. <laughs> like almost a year of filming, I'd say. Something like that, yeah. We have a question right in the top middle, right here. What's the most interesting animal you've seen while filming? Oh man, the most interesting animal, okay. Um, I would say, most interesting. Ah, squid are pretty cool. Uh, oh, no, no, I would go with, um, so there's this little animal called an ostracod. And um, they actually, they're only like two millimeters long. Uh, but at certain times of the year, they create these bioluminescent displays. So if you go dive at night, um, they like, it's like these blue, you know, sparkly bits going around in the water. Um, that's probably the most interesting. Okay, yeah. we have time for maybe two more questions. I'm going to go down here. Uh, what is an animal that you have not filmed that you really want to? Mm. Ooh, yeah, another good question. Yeah. Um, animal that I have not filmed? Oh, leopard seals. I would love to film leopard seals down in uh, Antarctica. Yeah, they're, just, they're massive as well and pretty charismatic. But mm. yeah, that's one. OK, I saw two more hands. I'm going to take one here and then one up there. And then I think we should move on. <laughs> All right. We could go for hours. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having us here oh, thank you. and sharing your talents with us. Um, my question for you is, I understand your goal of conservation and everything, but what is your personal dream for how you want to impact that in the future as you grow bigger in your career doing this? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think... So for, you know, if I were to have, you know, my ultimate goal, I think it would be continuing to do a bit of this that I do, like freelance camera work on larger productions. Um, but then also through my company, Diatom Studios, I'd really like to do more end-to-end -end productions on, like, projects that I'm really passionate about. Um, and then I, I tend to spread myself a bit too thin. But in addition to that, I would also like to start partnering with more, like, nonprofits and, and NGOs to kind of, like, you know, share my skill set as much as I can to you know help them push their causes. Okay, I'm on the back left. Any any bodily injuries or scars from animals that you filmed? <laughs> uh, any bodily injuries or scars? I've got a weird scar on my ankle from a leatherback sea turtle, which are they're huge. Yeah, really big. And um, I was out in Saint Croix in the Virgin Islands. And we were um, tagging them, basically. And so you, you walk the beach at night and just look for their trails to come up. And yeah, so I was basically like straddling this leatherback sea turtle and trying to take measurements of her while she was laying eggs. And she wasn't really having it and just like turned really quickly and just cut right into my ankle. It's probably the most interesting scar from an animal. Uh -huh. Hi. <laughs> Can you take one more question? Yes. <laughs> Have you ever seen a shark and how big was it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I've been fortunate enough to dive with quite a few sharks. Um, I'd say the biggest one was probably about 17 feet, and it was a great white in Australia. Uh, do you like sharks? Yeah? Do, what's your favorite? You like great whites? Yeah. Whites here. Oh, cool. Yeah, those are beautiful. Nice. Wow. Well, thank you so much for, for being here tonight. And um, we're going to come back in about 10 minutes. Hopefully, we'll have some more darkness behind us. Um, Jeff has a highlight reel of some of work that he has done that we'll be able to show, as well as uh, showing the documentary. And Jeff will give us a quick intro before we, we throw it to the, the actual film. So take a few minutes. We have restrooms open across the way. Uh, Wim's Auxiliary's got hot beverages and treats. Um, 
I'm sure Jeff would love to meet some of you. Don't get mobbed or anything. Um, but thank you all for being here. We'll be back in about 10, 15 minutes. Thanks, Jeff. Can we give him a round thank of applause? You. <laughs> I know, thanks.